Stacks allow us to create rows or columns of elements that automatically align, distribute, and spread themselves out within the available space, which not only means less tedious scaling and repositioning for us on the canvas, but also lets us build bulletproof layouts that can flex and adapt when things in the browser change size. Stacks not only unlock relative positioning, but also new sizing options that can make elements fill their parent or make a parent frame automatically fit its children. In this lesson, we're going to look at how stacks and relative position layers work and how they make our lives easier and, of course, when to use them. If you're already familiar with auto layout in Figma or Flexbox and CSS, you've got a head start. But either way, you're in the right place because we're going to start with the basics. Let's jump in. In the first lesson of this chapter, I started to get you thinking in frames. Now I want to get you thinking in stacks. First things first, a stack is a frame, but a frame with a special layout property applied. You can select any frame, like this minimalist nav bar, which has some absolute position text layers floating around in it. And on the properties panel, we can click to add a layout. Now this frame is considered a stack and automatically arranges its direct child layers in either a vertical column or a horizontal row. In this case, a horizontal row, which Framer guessed automatically based on the arrangement of layers. You'll notice now when I try to move one of these text boxes, it either snaps back into place or switches places with its siblings. In fact, nudging with the arrow keys on the keyboard changes the sorting too. What you're seeing here is the behavior of layers set to relative positioning. Relative layers go with the flow of the stack, respecting the available space and the space occupied by their sibling layers. The stack itself is in charge of the gaps, padding, and alignment. The content flows in the same order it's arranged on the layers panel. Pretty much any time you see a set of elements evenly spaced horizontally or vertically, you're probably looking at an opportunity to use a stack. The text and CTA button in a hero section could be a vertical stack. Content within a card could be a stack, and a row of those very cards could be another stack. In fact, this navigation bar has a stack for the logo, a stack for the links, and the whole thing itself is a stack. Even a frame with a single child layer like a button could be a stack to keep the text neatly centered and padded automatically. Even if the text changes, because stacks have the unique ability to automatically fit the content within them which is great when you need the size of the child layers to be in charge. In fact, a little trick to instantly turn a frame into a stack and fit to its content is to right click and choose fit content or press shift A on the keyboard. The bottom line is that stacks are perfect when you want elements to flow in a single direction with consistent spacing, alignment, and distribution. And they also unlock some powerful sizing options for designing fluid layouts, which we're going to dig into in the next lesson. Before we dig into the properties of a stack, I want to show you a couple other ways to create them. If you know you're going to need one before you've even drawn a frame, you can draw a new frame with a vertical or horizontal stack layout already applied. Just click the layout button on the toolbar, choose rows or columns, then drag to draw your new stack on the canvas. It'll come with a couple of placeholder layers, but you can do with those what you please. You can also wrap a set of selected layers in a stack by right-clicking and choosing Add Stack. Or with the shortcut Option Command Return on a Mac, Control Alt Enter on a PC. You'll notice the new stack that gets created automatically stretches to fill the width of its parent and fit the height of its children. This is actually a behavior that we changed somewhat recently following a bunch of requests to make this method more responsive out of the box. You'll be glad about these defaults when you spend more time designing responsive layouts. Let's head back to our navbar example and dig into the properties of a stack. The first and most fundamental property of a stack is the direction. Do we want things to flow horizontally or vertically? We consider this the main axis of the stack. You can think of the main axis as a stick. You can think of the child layers as little marshmallows. Who doesn't love marshmallows? Then we can decide how elements are distributed across the available space along the main axis. Are the marshmallows at the start of the stick, the center of the stick, or the end of the stick? You may be wondering why start and end and not left and right. That's because the term start and end always makes sense, no matter which direction the stack goes. It's web terminology. 
The next three options give us different ways to distribute across all the available space. Space between distributes the space between each element with no space on the sides. Space around puts the same amount of space around each element, which means the space actually doubles up between side-by-side -side elements. And space evenly, which distributes the exact same amount of space between and around each element, all equal gaps. With start, center, and end, we have a property to control the gaps manually. And we also get draggable handles on the canvas to visually adjust the gaps. But you'll notice that every element in the stack always shares the same gap. If you have a scenario where two or more layers need to have a different gap than the rest, what do we do? We just wrap them in their own stack. Easy as that. Back to our first example. We looked at how the distribute property slides things along the main axis, but we also have a property to determine how things are aligned in the other direction. We call this perpendicular axis the cross axis, and we can choose start, center, or end. Again, web terminology that makes sense in both directions. The last property is padding, which is an invisible cushion of space around the inside of the stack. You may have noticed that when I set distribute to start or end, our layers went right up to the edge. This is where a little bit of padding can make a big difference. Padding is also extremely helpful when combined with a height or width that's set to fit contents, like the button we looked at earlier, since the bounds of the stack would otherwise clamp down too tightly around the children. By default, padding affects all sides equally, but we do have a toggle to show separate values for each side. You'll also find that if you have too many items to fit in the available space, they'll continue to run on and potentially overflow. For this, we have wrap. When there's no more room in a line, the elements are moved to the next row or column, keeping elements flowing without getting cut off. Another way to use stacks to make life easier is to apply a stack layout to an entire breakpoint frame. Similar to our layers in our navigation earlier, this allows us to drag to rearrange entire sections of our pages and means we can control padding and gaps between sections. We'll talk about this more in the next lesson, but with the stack layout applied, we can also change the height of this breakpoint to fit content. So it'll automatically grow or shrink as we add, remove, and resize content. So you can see how stacks can be super helpful at the most macro and the most micro level of your layouts, saving us time, making our layouts more consistent, and keeping them that way, even if the size of things change but this is really just the beginning. Things get even more powerful when we use the new sizing options that stacks unlock for us, which is exactly what we're learning in the next lesson. See you there.